Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness? Have you been considering seeing a therapist, but you're not sure where to start? BetterHelp will assess your counseling needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist so you can start getting the support you need online in under 24 hours. Special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek here with my wonderful friend and partner, Ananga Severe. And this month we are celebrating 12 years of producing the Anxiety Slayer podcast. It's so awesome to have been in partnership with you this long, Ananga, and thank you for continuing to show up. Thank you. 12 years, eh? Yeah, right? But I'm just thinking back to when we first set our intention to create the podcast and really happy we're both still together and still sharing. Yes. And just so you know, we are going to be doing our annual anniversary sale. So if you've been waiting to gobble up one of our online courses, you can do so at half price for the entire month of October. All you have to do is use the coupon code half price sale, and you can find more information about all of our courses at anxietyslayer.com and at anxietyslayer.teachable.com. Today, we're going to be talking about how connection heals anxiety. We often receive emails and posts from our listeners and group members about how they feel nervous to tell the people in their lives that they love about their anxiety because they fear being viewed as irrational or weak or a burden. But at the same time, if they avoid talking about anxiety, they can feel even more isolated. And this is where connection comes in. We absolutely deserve and need human connection. Yeah, it's uh, such an important thing and it's such a brave and vulnerable thing to do to share when we're suffering with our mental well-being, if we're feeling low or we're feeling anxious. And I've seen many times in the last year, um, young people in particular going forward in the retail sector who are struggling with the added challenges of COVID on top of an already challenging job, dealing with the public day in, day out. And they've gone forward to supervisors and managers expressing that they're struggling in companies that purport to be advocates for mental well-being, and they've been treated very poorly. So I think it's important to raise this point that if we are treated poorly in response to doing something very brave, to know that the fault does not lie with us. Because with anxiety, we can really internalize things, as you said, Shannon, feel like a burden. But if somebody is a health advocate, then their actions have to match the statement. And that doesn't always happen. Yes. And the stigma around anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges creates a disconnect, which can do so much damage. And this is why. We absolutely need to bridge that gap with kindness and connection and sweetness, whether it be family, friends, employers, schools. As you were talking about some of the ways that employers are treating their employees, some of the schools are also uh, higher education learning here in the state. Some of the colleges are really not handling things as well as I'd like to see with the students who are still reeling from the pandemic and wondering what's next and trying to navigate in-person classes, online classes, being with large groups of students, masked or unmasked, vaccined or, you know, all of those things. These are young people trying to navigate their lives as it is. And so when you create a stigma around it, when you create a suck it up, attitude around it. That's completely unfair. And so I think both Ananga and I just want to bring forward that we know this stuff is happening. We also know there's a lot of people who are showing kindness and compassion, but the truth is many are not. 
And so this is something that we had to bring forward. Here's what we know. Judgment makes people withdraw, and that's the last thing we need. The stigma and this judgment is so incredibly unhealthy. We need more understanding. And understanding doesn't mean full comprehension. It doesn't mean we get everything that's going on. But it also doesn't mean trying to fix it. It means just allowing that space to understand that somebody is going through something very difficult and everyone deserves that space and that respect. Anxiety is very bewildering and it's life ruining. It's a very difficult thing to navigate. So when we're suffering with anxiety, we don't need people trying to fix us. We don't need people trying to tell us what to do. We need the respect and understanding that we're doing the best we can. And the best thing with anxiety, if you really are an advocate, is to hear without judgment and with respect. Yeah, to just be there for somebody. The, the understanding piece means being there and hearing and caring without judgment and asking, coming back to my very favorite question, how do you feel and what do you need? How, how can I support you versus having all of the answers? And these are just really important. And, and we have seen some improvements around understanding. We have seen many more people with very high profile people in the world, whether they be athletes or entrepreneurs or in the spotlight in one way, shape, or form who are coming forward with their battles with mental health and anxiety and depression and all of, all of the above. And it has been a doorway for many to have these people be that vulnerable and step up and say, this is what's going on and, and here's what I'm doing about it. Yeah, it's incredibly courageous. And I think, again, to just come back to that point that if you're not met with kindness, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's a flaw to not be able to show kindness. So don't take it in. If somebody else is incapable of showing kindness and understanding, that's for them to work on. But anxiety will often, you know, have us draw it in. It's like, oh, just see, I spoke up and, you know, what's wrong with me? We have our challenges. There's nothing wrong. We're living with challenges. But please don't make that an, an added thing that you're trying to deal with. If somebody else can't show compassion and understanding, if somebody else is bypassing your experience, that's not yours to carry. No, it's not. I just realized that today I'm wearing my Treat People with Kindness t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but I got at a Harry Styles concert with my daughter. Oh, cool. <laughs> who, who is long past listening to Harry, but her mother still is. So just so you know. <laughs> Let's talk about the age that we're living in, the, the age of disconnection, because we're spending less time in the company of others, more time messaging on our phones. We are often socially disconnected by the pressure to push through and keep going and doing whatever needs to be done on that giant to-do list. And the nature of anxiety and depression often causes us to isolate. And on top of that, the pandemic has made this even more prevalent, stoking the fire of fear and health anxiety. Yeah. It's a very challenging time. And disconnection is really something that builds anxiety, increases anxiety. It can cause anxiety even if we're doing relatively okay. Feeling disconnected is a very uncomfortable feeling. So it's something around us. It's something that's inherent in our society, the way we live, and something we need to be able to show ourselves compassion, that that's the environment, and then, okay, how can I find more connection, which we'll be talking about in the second half of this episode. How can I find a way to feel safe and reach out and build more connection into my life for protecting my nervous system? It really helps us build resilience when we have necessary connection. And so much of this disconnect is caused by technology. Screens by nature are dissociating. We're, we're taking in virtual information through a glass window which is incredibly ungrounding 
for our minds, for all of our minds, whether you suffer with anxiety or not. And the information we're receiving through our screens is subtle, rapidly changing, and sometimes disturbing. And all of those things provoke vata. And as you know, you've heard us talk about the vata dosha. Vata is already very susceptible to anxiety because of the nature of the, of the dosha. So as you have all this stuff coming at you, and what and I just think about, and, and of course, I'm not a doctor, and I don't know if there's any studies that talk about this. There probably are. But the scrolling and what you're doing with your eyes, whether it be up, down, up, down, up, down on, on the phone or side to side with, with all of the, the switching and sliding. And, and I just can't imagine that over long periods of time, that's good for your eyes. I mean, it's, I know that it causes lots of headaches and stuff, but, but also I, I would guess that it absolutely contributes to feeling more anxious as well. It's kind of a fight or flight movement way to use your eyes. If you think back to prior generations, say, you know, great grandparents so many years ago before we had all this technology around us and how they would spend their time, I can't really think of a example where somebody would be working that close up with that much eye movement. So it's a recent thing that we're living with and uh, something we need to be aware of and get out in nature as much as we can. Or if it's, you know, the weather's not great, look out the window as far away as we can to stretch our eyes out and relax those up close muscles and, and switch things up. Well, and frankly, even if it, even if the weather isn't lovely outside, it's not going to hurt you to go out in the rain. And of course, I, I love a warm summer rain. That's, that's pretty easy to, to go out and get caught in. But, but I guess I, the only reason why I bring this forward, Ananga, is I just don't want us to make any excuses to not get outside unless, unless we're dealing with some you know, frigid cold temperatures <laughs> or a, a blinding rainstorm or whatever. Get, get outside. Get please. Uh, do what you can to give your eyes a rest, to even stop and just gaze, break things up to, and just look out 20 feet away and give yourself a break. I know working at home, I can really get lost in my computer and lost in my screens. And sometimes I'll catch myself both on my phone and on my laptop at the same time and be like, what, you know, what the hell am I, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> but I make a very conscious effort to break it, break things up and to get outside. And even if it's to be in, in my garden for a minute, even if it's just to take a nice breath, just to breathe in a few rounds of fresh air. And I know you guys, this is like, duh, this is so simple, so silly. But truly, if you are buried in technology to the degree that I think you might be, Every choice matters. Every choice that you're away from the screen to give yourself something different matters. It's really important to check in on ourselves with our choices during the day and what devices we're spending time on. And if you really slow down and listen to your body, often you see that our eyes get fuzzy or our ears get whooshy. Um, we can get back pain. Our posture becomes stooped. So it's, it's just good to notice and. Yeah, sometimes we need to use the stuff to get what we need to, to do done, but to break it up as much as possible and stretch out and really look to other forms of consuming information as much as we can and pick up a paper book if we're reading online a lot, just try and change things around. This loss of connection that we're talking about that increases anxiety. David Frawley, who is the author of Ayurveda, and the mind had a great quote that you pulled to share about why this happens. High vata as excess ether makes us ungrounded, spaced out, and unrealistic. Our connection with the physical body and with physical reality becomes weakened. We live in our thoughts, which we may confuse with perception. Our life force gets dispersed by the excess activity of the mind. We lose contact with other people and cannot heed their advice. This is so true. It's incredibly true. And 
for years I have said perception is reality. And not that I truly believe perception is reality, but the way that our world works, look at the media, look at the messaging, look at the perceptions that we have that we think are reality. And David so succinctly talks about this, that when we live in our thoughts, we may confuse them with perception. Yeah. And if you think about how anxiety works, that is what happens in the ungrounded mind. Because we'll have some symptom in the body that could purely be caused by dehydration. We might just need to get a drink, take a, you know, take a warm drink, stretch, breathe, relax ourselves for, for a minute or two. But that symptom will cause the mind to say, oh my God, what if it's this? And then we, we perceive it as a reality and then the fear kicks in. The more grounded we are, the less we're at the mercy of such thoughts being confused with perception, being confused with fact. And also this other thing that's very common when we have high vata is the scattered energy of our life force, which we normally gather. It's what we gather to direct ourselves, to make good choices, to put our ideas and aspirations into action. We need that life energy. But when we're anxious, it's scattered. Mm-hmm. It's dispersed. So that's why we feel all shaky and all over the place. And then the last point he makes is that we lose contact. So we're talking about connection in this episode. We lose connection with other people and we can't heed advice. Sometimes some really good advice comes our way and it might be very simple and it might be really powerful and able to help us make a change. But when we're scattered, we cannot hear it and we can't pull ourselves together. We can't pull our life force together to act on it. Which is why we so often hear from people who are suffering with anxiety. I've tried that. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. I can't do breathing. It makes me more anxious. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that because of that disbursement, because of being scattered and just unavailable to receive it. And the beautiful creative nature of Vata when it's balanced would say, oh, breathing doesn't work so well for me. I wonder if I could do some yoga, some stretching. I wonder if I could try some tapping. I wonder maybe I could bring some chamomile tea into my day and switch it out for coffee. But when we're scattered, we're very all or nothing and the mind just isn't our friend and it's not going to help us use that creativity. So this is a really important quote. I think there's so much in there to to think on. After the break, we'll be talking about what you can do to increase your sense of connection to help you calm anxiety. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness and preventing you from living your best life? There have been a few times in my life where I've needed some extra support and wish I had an option for online support. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. To be clear, BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online, and their service is available for clients worldwide. You get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to leave your home. It's more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. You can start living a happier life today. Special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash slayer. Before the break, we talked about the ways we experience disconnection and how that can increase anxiety. Now we're going to look at ways to find connection and feel grounded and at ease. The first part of this is that we need to show and receive kindness. Kindness is open, caring, and thoughtful. It's the little things like a cup of tea, some humor, going for a walk together, just being with another person in their space, in their presence, without judgment, without anything other than being. And this is why it's incredibly important to seek out friends and family 
that are warm and kind by nature. Sometimes people surprise us with how much understanding they have. Sometimes people will share what they're also carrying and then you develop some connection together of mutual understanding. Sometimes they're just kind people and and they're able to, you know, you can go for a walk with them or have a conversation and keep keep fishing. Just because one person isn't, and it takes courage to reach out, but if one person doesn't meet kindly, keep looking because they don't represent everyone. You know, that, and that's the thing. If you have even one or two people that you can fall apart with, you are so lucky. Yeah. I think about how blessed I am to have you in my life and my, my good friends, um, Jennifer and Amy, and how I can be in whatever space that I'm in, whether I'm anxious or whether I'm sad or whether I'm incredibly irritated by something or, or whether I just need a good cry, mm-hmm. uh, that, that I have a loved one that I can feel grounded and safe with. In addition to the anxiety that many of us feel and are feeling, we also have right now anxiety about the pandemic and how COVID has brought so many challenges to our mental health through the isolation that we've been under. And more than ever, if you have the opportunity to be with those you love safely, you need to take it. Because again, this whole conversation, anxiety is eased by close contact. It's eased by hugs. The sense of touch is very important to those of a Vata nature and those who are Vata disturbed. And of course, with that being said, everyone benefits from a big hug from loved ones in a safe environment. And I think in the West, we have such a heavy expectation of being happy, being okay, but we're not always happy and we're not always okay. And the more we can be fluid about that and understand that if we're having a difficult time, it doesn't mean we're a burden. Right. It doesn't mean we're lacking. It just it means what it means. We're having a difficult time. And it's a very natural and wonderful thing to support each other and hug each other and be there for each other and to really listen with presence. It's an absolute blessing to give and receive those things. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, if it's safe to do so, we, we need to get back to that physical connection with those we love and time with those we love. I was sharing with you, Shan, before we started recording today, how last week was my daughter's birthday. And we went to her cousin's home and we all ate outside and chatted and laughed together. And then as the evening wore on, they lit a fire and we sat around the fire pit for hours, just chatting and asking each other, you know, how are you doing? Some of us hadn't been able to get be together for some time. So just really catching up and I was so happy and it really warmed my heart to see how everyone was caring for each other and listening to each other and and offering support where there were areas of concern or struggle. And it was just the nicest, simplest thing just to sit around a fire and be together and talk together. And, And those are the things that really help us, help us feel grounded. And I absolutely love that you all did that outside. Because connecting with nature, not only were you connecting with loved ones, feeling grounded and safe, you were also outside doing it. And nature and connecting with nature is incredibly important if you're suffering with anxiety and depression. A study by Mind found that 71% of people reported decreased feelings of anxiety after a 30-minute walk in a green environment. And we know this is true. This is something that if you think of yourself as a, a sweet flower, you need sunshine and you need water and you need nourishment. And the screen time and the isolation has often taken us away from connecting with nature. The more present and connected to the details of nature we can be at this time and we can make at this time, the more we'll benefit even more to notice the colors of the feathers of the bird, the, how, a, how the leaves 
sound when they're rustling in the wind, how they feel when they're crunching under your feet, uh, you know, all of this stuff to just be completely immersed in it. And Ananga and I have both just recorded time in nature for our Patreon. Ananga out by the woods and with the birds and me by my beloved Lake Michigan that I can't seem to stay away from. If you're not already a patron of Anxiety Slayer, we invite you to come out and hang with us. If you think that that could be helpful for you, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash anxiety slayer. It's such an easy thing to say, spend time in nature. And when we're feeling anxious, we often hear it with a bit of a thud. It's like, oh yeah, spend time in nature, you know, and the mind will say, you have no idea how much I'm suffering. Right. And you're telling me to go listen to a bird, look at a leaf. But I have personal experience of this helping me at a time when I was going through intense trauma. And it came after a really heavy medical diagnosis that I was just getting on my feet from when the next thing hit. And my way of coping was to go to a botanical gardens with my daughter every Saturday and walk and breathe. And I was shaky and really struggling. What helped me was to really connect with the nature that was there. So I started taking photos, close-up photos of flowers and just looking at the color and the texture and smelling them and feeling the leaves and feeling the texture of bark on branches, going in the hothouse and really breathing in that earthy, steamy smell and being incredibly aware. The whole thing was like a macro experience. Mm -hmm. I got into so much detail and gradually I noticed it was holding my mind. And I think it's one of a, a couple of things that really saved me. So when I say go out and connect in nature and when I share in this recording, nature recording that I've just created for our patrons, to me, it's something that's so personally relevant. Yeah. And we don't share anything unless it's personally relevant. True. We're not into throwing out platitudes. <laughs> and in Ayurveda, it's, it's a medicinal practice. So I, I can share that it's really helped me. It's really helped me as well for most of my life. I've always found myself in nature when I need extra support when I'm feeling, when I'm not feeling like myself. And of course, as the work we've done with Anxiety Slayer over the last 12 years, it's just shown me how naturally knowing to do that and continuing to do that, how helpful it's been for my peace of mind. Ayurveda teaches that the function of our senses is to bring knowledge or information to the mind. And Dr. Vasant Ladd teaches that vision is food for the eyes, sound is food for the ears, touch is food for the skin, and taste is food for the tongue. I love this so much because when we're in and present with our senses, everything can change. We often go about our days in front of the screens, on autopilot. We're not present with our food. We're just getting something quick. Sometimes we don't even sit down to eat it. Uh, we're, we're living mechanically. We're going through the motions. Our senses are picking up constant stimulation that gets sent to our already overtired mind for processing. And most of it's useless. Constant noise and fleeting images, anything that overstimulates the mind and nerves until we feel exhausted, and sometimes we don't even understand why. We don't even realize, oh my gosh, you know, actually, when I fell down the rabbit hole of TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, uh, that that can be exhausting versus using our senses in a conscious way, consciously being in the present moment. This is such a beautiful form of connection that really can help us anchor in to the moment and experience. It makes me think of a, when I was going through yoga teacher training, my teacher, Sandra, had us all take a dried cherry 
and put it in our mouth, close our eyes and just put it on the top of our tongue and just let it sit there. And what, what did that taste like? And was it sour? Was it sweet? Was it both? What did that feel like? What was happening in our mouth with that dried cherry? And the presence that I had in that moment, any other time I'd have been like, oh yeah, that sounds good. You know, grab a few, chuck them in my mouth, chew them up, whatever, onto something else. Right. And we were in this moment of just really being there, being mindful about what we had just done. And, and, and so that's like a, just a, a simple little example of what this can be like. Yeah. And it's, it's a simple thing again, but really important because if we're grabbing food on the go and we're not even sitting down to eat, we don't even know what we've eaten and we're not going to benefit from it. You know, health comes from what we digest. And if we're moving around, we're not going to digest it properly. And if we're not in contact with it, we're not going to digest it properly. And we're not going to feel the nourishment or the gratitude, even on an emotional level, it's not nourishing us. Nothing's happening. It's just this mechanical grab and go, and we suffer for it. So when we're using our senses consciously, it builds another form of connection with our environment, with what's coming into our senses. And that helps us anchor ourselves to the present moment. And it helps ground us. And it actually helps calm anxiety because it just brings all that scattered energy in, in that connection. So we can use all of our senses in this healing way, our taste, as you just shared the example of the cherry, mindful eating of clean, healthy food. See what spices you can notice. See what flavors you can notice. And really get involved in your meals with, with gratitude, grateful eating. And then we'll digest better and we'll feel so much more content and sustained by our meals. Smell the scent of flowers, fresh air, the earth calming essential oils, all things that can bring peace to the mind and contentment to the heart. And then, as we mentioned before, touch. The sense of touch is so important in calming anxiety. So taking a warm bath, oil massage, feeling the grass on bare feet and a hug from a loved one. Or just curling up, curling up with a blanket and being grateful for your, for your bed and the surface that's supporting you, being present with those sensations and hearing, hearing bird song, calming music, water sounds, other sounds of nature, and then sight, soothing colors. The color green is very soothing to the eyes. So to go look at the grass, look at the trees, water and the sky, flowers, big open space, and also looking at spiritual imagery is very uplifting when we bring that in through, through our sight. So there's so much we can do to build a sense of connection naturally for ourselves. And all of this helps us feel less scattered, more grounded, more present, and less anxious. Ananga, thank you for another fun conversation and hopefully supportive conversation to all who listen in. We invite you to celebrate with us. The Anxiety Slayer podcast is celebrating 12 years. And to mark the occasion, every course in the Anxiety Slayer Academy is 50% off with the coupon code Half Price Sale. You can explore all of our courses at anxietyslayer.com or anxietyslayer.teachable.com. Mm-hmm.